guest today operates at the intersection of the left brain and the right brain. She started her career in film and advertising, working with clients on projects for McDonald's, Nike, Coca-Cola, and PBS. After two decades leading projects and teams in Chicago, New York City, and London, she shifted gears to focus on emotional intelligence and women's leadership. Although it might seem like a hard left turn to some, she sees that shift in her career as a natural extension of her passion for storytelling authenticity and making a positive impact on people's lives. Creativity is at the core of her work. Whether she's working with a corporate client or collaborating on a film project, she keeps her own creative juices flowing through her kung fu practice, a green belt with her sights on making it black, dance anytime, anywhere, yoga, and writing. My guest is Melissa Thornley. I'm Aiden Nepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Well, hello, Melissa. Welcome to The Changed Podcast. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> excited to be here I did talk, talking about change and the art of change what it's it's a beautiful thing Melissa how do you feel about change generally speaking do you find that you get excited about change or is change something that is challenging for you I happen to thrive on change I love change now there hasn't like if you look at change that's going on in the world right now, some of it isn't as easy as one would like. And sure. some of it is a little bit uncomfortable. So, um, and not all of it is sort of internally motivated. It's more what's happening in the world and we're dealing with what's happening in the world. So it's a, I think it changes a little bit different when it's coming from inside versus when it's imposed upon you. But all in all, I love change and, you know, You've heard it a million times. The only constant is change, right? Yeah. I mean, I, that's how I feel. It's silly to imagine that there would be a world in which nothing ever changes. And I don't, I don't think even people who struggle with change, who find it challenging, I don't think they think that that's true, um, that there is somehow a way to stop changing. But there is this wish to slow it down sometimes. Oh, yeah. And it, it all goes back to those changes. You know, sometimes you look in the mirror and you're like, wait a minute, is that a wrinkle or that, that there's that thing or, you know, there's a hair like growing out of my chin that I wasn't there the last time I looked, something like that. Those types of changes are a little bit different. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, so tell me a little bit about um, your women's leadership work and the work that you do around emotional intelligence. I'm very curious about those things. Oh, Thank you for asking. Well, it's the women's leadership thing came kind of naturally because the last time I checked, I was a woman, still I'm a woman right now. And uh, my background is in post-production, which is part of the film and advertising overlay, right? A lot of people don't necessarily realize what post-production is. I think maybe now because everybody has a whole film crew in their phone, um, they get it a little bit. <laughs> true. They kind of get it a little bit more, but I worked in post-production for, gosh, almost 20 years. And a lot of the industry was male-led and the same, <clears throat> excuse me, the same thing with advertising. So as I grew in my career, I ended up working a lot with, you know, I worked with an executive coach. I worked, I became, a, I ended up studying leadership on my own. And I realized that women actually can use you know, different types of support. Men can actually use different types of support as well. And when it all boils down, what it all boils down to is emotional intelligence and leveraging different emotional intelligence skills. So, you know, I feel like there's so much out there about emotional intelligence, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. And at the same time, there's also this kind of myth that, oh, you know, I don't have any, I'm not really that great emotional intelligence, or it's about emotions, or, mm -hmm. you know, women are better at it than men, or whatever the myth is. I feel like everybody understanding that they're all skills, we can practice them, we can learn them, we can grow and evolve, and it's a great way to actually deal with change right? Because we get in this, we get in this different types of data. You know, if you look at emotions as data, 
whether it's your own internal emotions or emotions that are being expressed by those around you or in the world, you actually realize, wait a minute, this is data, this is important. And if I pay mm -hmm. attention, I can make better decisions. And if I'm making better decisions, well, that makes life a little bit more manageable. So is that what it means uh, when people talk about emotional intelligence? Are they talking about actually using emotions as a as an input? Because it seems like, you know, it's easy to think of the business world as like, this is an emotionless, logic-driven experience. So is that what, when, when people are talking about emotional intelligence, is that what they're talking about? There's all sorts of ways to look at it. I look at it as different, at, as different skills. So I actually, there's an assessment that I work with that's called the EQI 2.0, and it breaks it down into five areas and 15 skills. And the skills are all skills that you can learn and leverage, right? Um, I look at emotions as data, right? So if you're making decisions, then taking in the, um, taking in all of the data is important. So some of the data might be just sales numbers. Mm -hmm. It might be, you know, information on your supply chain and on your vendors. Like it, it could be very like actual logical data driven, mm -hmm. but if you're getting information from the team that something isn't going well and you're completely ignoring it, or if you're ignoring that you're, you're ignoring that your boss or your leader is not happy with your work or you're misinterpreting what's going on in a meeting. I mean, gosh, you're the expert on that. Something's going wrong in a meeting and you're not picking up what people are putting down. You are in trouble. And it's, it's, it's a key thing. People get into a career or they get into a role because of their IQ and because of their cognitive abilities and their abilities to produce results, right? But you get to a certain point where your ability to, pr to produce results on your own is minimal compared to what you can do with others. And then you really have to be leveraging emotional intelligence in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the female leadership that you work with has a different inherent approach to this or is this, uh, or is teaching this skill and helping people sort of explore it similar um, with the clients that you work with? Yeah, that's, you know, Aiden, that's a great question. I think that it depends also on different people and the point you're at in your career. So for example, if you're starting out in your career or you're say an individual contributor, or basically you're just not managing others, then you're judged based on the work that you're doing and how much you're putting that out there, how much, not necessarily tooting your own horn, but how much you're letting others know about your opinions, your point of view, your intellect, your ideas, your strategies, that type of thing. And so there's um, one of the emotional intelligence skills is, you know, is assertiveness and independence and being able to really be assertive and very independent about your perspective on what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. That's key, right? As you move up your, you move up the career ladder and you're a people leader, well then, yes, you want to have a point of view. You want to have a perspective on how things are to go. And if at every meeting, it's all about what you think and it's all about your perspective and you're not getting input from your team and you're not talking to others, then it's going to really limit your capacity to lead. So you have to be a little bit more flexible. Your listening skills have to go up. Your assertiveness and independence doesn't go away, but you might assert your ideas at the end of the meeting instead of at the beginning. You know, it always cracks mm -hmm. me up when people are like, oh, I really want to hear what everybody thinks about this topic. And here's what I think about this topic. And that, and that, that everybody in the meeting is like, what, what, do I say that? You know, I think the exact opposite of what that person <laughs> just said. So do I say that now? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's about looking at the different skills and when to use them, when to flex them, and, um, and, it, and it can vary. But to your, gender, to your gender question, I do think that there is a level of assertiveness and independence that women could use earlier in their career to leverage, mm -hmm. like whether it's leveraging their networks, whether it's, whether it's um, talking more astutely and pointedly and being to, the, you know, being to the point about the skills and what they bring to the table and how they add value. We don't necessarily think about it in that way. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a stereotype, but I think a lot mm -hmm. of women think, okay, 
I'm doing a great work. Obviously, people must know that I'm doing great work, where meanwhile, right. other, other people might not be, might, other, other, other men might not do it that way, right? There's that statistic where um, men, when they're looking at a job, if they have one, is, it's a very low percentage. They don't have to have all of the boxes ticked when they're about to apply for a job, whereas women might look at a role and say, oh, wow, you know, yeah, I can do all of that, but, you know, these three, these three, these three pieces that they're looking for, I don't have that experience yet. Right, right. And then they don't necessarily go for that promotion or go for that role. Whereas men might look at it and they, they'd say, oh, well, yeah, but I, sure, yeah, I can do that. So there's that level of assertiveness and independence that I think women are, you know, it's changing, but I do think it's an area where most women can use a little bit of extra support. On the flip side, do you think that there are feminine qualities that more, um, I'm going to go, I mean, it's, it's feels weird to be talking about this in a binary way um, because it's not just men leading and women leading uh, though. Statistically it is still very binary and still leaning heavily male, but that is shifting a bit. So, you know, it feels weird to talk about it in a binary way. That being said, are there feminine qualities that you think are beneficial to leadership in a broad way? Yes. I love this question, Aiden, because (laughs) what we're talking about here is we're talking about like the masculine and the feminine in a, not based on men and women, right? We're not talking about it as a, in a gender, right? We're looking at it in terms of energy, so for example, like in, in Chinese medicine, you know, or in, in uh, yeah, in Chinese medicine, they, they look at yin and yang, right? You look at masculine properties and feminine pro- properties, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So if you're, you can do the same thing with leadership. So the, what I would consider and what people consider feminine qualities in leadership would be qualities like listening and sort of reading the room. And sort of taking a pause and making sure that things are um, using your intuition and not just forging straight ahead. So if you think about sort of uh, receiving, right, the receiving side of things, if you're constantly in go, 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 which if you take, if you flip it over, so we talked about some feminine skills Mm -hmm. and um, feminine qualities, you look at the masculine qualities, which are more action oriented, that assertiveness, that independence. I'm not saying masculine in the sense that it means men. Mm-hmm, I'm just mm-hmm. saying that in, in a, it means action oriented. And that's just sort of an energetic way of describing it. So if you're going, 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 eventually you're going to burn out. There needs to be that balance of making, making the call and then also pausing. I mean, think about a negotiation if you talk too fast or you go first, you have to kind of have that pause and let there be space because without the space, you know, you might lose lots of money if you just, you know, drive forward instead of giving space and silence for, you know, the next number to appear or the next, you know, the next section. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and for, for you, and then also for listeners out there, there's an excellent book on it called Shakti Leadership, written by uh, Nalima Bhatt. She, and, and it's co-authored by Nalima Bhatt and Raj Sisodia. And Raj Sisodia is one of the founders of the Conscious Capitalism Movement. Very and so cool. they, they co-wrote a book called Shakti Leadership, and it looks at feminine and masculine qualities of leadership and how you can balance and use all of them. It's not an either or, it's sort of a both and situation. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for the, uh, for the reference. Uh, I'll have to pick up a copy myself. Um, so in the work that you do, uh, around this, these ideas and others, uh, what's the relationship with the, you know, it's a changing business climate and that's always true. So it's true right now. And that's also always true. Um, I'm, a, I'm making an assumption that you help people a little bit around these ideas of change. What are some of the things that you have found to be particularly helpful in working with your leadership clients? So I think when change is happening, when we're in the middle of it, 
it can feel like a mess, right? It always looks like a mess, especially when you're in the middle of it. I mean, think about when you pop into a movie, like you're flicking through the channels and you hit the middle of the movie. It's nor that's normally when everything is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Because the hero and the heroine, they haven't, they haven't solved the, the, the crime yet, right? When we are in the middle of change, it feels like, okay, let's just get to it, right? Let's mm -hmm. get certain about some things and let's just get to that next step. And I think what is really helpful is to just be present in what is actually happening because oftentimes we fight with reality when we're going through change. So we either are trying to fast forward to get through the change or we're trying to hang on to what is changing and not letting go of it. So having the presence to be in the moment and then allow what is happening, that is what keeps you moving. It's sort of like if you're not Let's think of an analogy here, but like you're in, when you're in the car and you're going, you, you're, you're moving to the next thing. You're constantly moving, but you're not getting ahead of yourself, right? I mean, sometimes I wish it could be like Star Trek and they could just beam us <laughs> off and they could beam us someplace. Yeah, right? absolutely. That, it doesn't, that, that, that's not a reality, at least today. It's not, not a reality. Yet. And that's not how change works, right? You have to be in the moment in order to get to the next moment. I think that that's, uh, the car analogy makes a ton of sense because even though you're headed from point A to point B, you still have to check your mirrors. You still have to, um, you know, be in the car in that moment to respond to things that may be coming your way, lights change, stop signs, all of that stuff. So that's a great analogy. Yes. Well, um, I would love if you would be willing to share, um, speaking of change, a story from your real life of a moment of pivot that you personally experienced. So would you, could you, Melissa, tell us a story? Sure. You know, what I would tell you about is the time when I decided to actually um, leave advertising for good, right? It was one of those things where it was a very, I, it was very um, Robert De Niro, no, Al Pacino, <laughs> Robert, would, Bobby De Niro would be so mad at me that I just said that. Al yeah, Pacino that, and The Godfather. Right. Yeah, you got to get that right. You, you can't, even right. though they're in a you million cannot. movies together. Mr. Pacino, you know, when he's in The Godfather, he's like, I keep trying to get out and they keep pulling me back. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how I felt about advertising because I love it because the people are super creative. You're working with great teams. It's super collaborative. You're coming. It's very idea generated. And then one of the pivotal moments, I, um, I, it was when I was running, I, I was in London, running the London office for this company that I spoke about. And I, um, and I was happy. I was happy in London. I, we were on vacation. We were in Egypt. I'm on this sailboat. We're on a sailboat. And I hadn't even turned my cell phone off because I didn't think that I would get a call or anything. And my cell phone, my little flip phone goes off. And the flip phone goes off and it's the owner of the company saying that he and his wife, who they were partners in the company, that they were leaving the company and that they wanted me to move back to Chicago to run the company and be the managing director. And I got that phone call floating down a sailboat on the Nile River, like in the middle of nowhere where I didn't even think I the phone just rings and it almost felt like God you know it almost felt like wait a minute is God like calling me on you know in the middle of nowhere and so I pick it up I, I and, and I, I already told you what Charles told me and at that moment I was like I don't even know if I want to move back to Chicago like why I'm in living in London I'm having the time of my life I'm finally it took me forever to finally feel like I had um, vested, like the, the, the people in the company trusted me. It took time to build that trust and build that team. And it, and now you want me to pick up when I'm finally making some progress and you want, want me to pick up and move back to Chicago. And it was a really surprisingly tough decision. And so I, it was a complete and utter change, you know, and my husband at the time was not, he was living in New York. He didn't want to move back to Chicago either. So I ended up doing it and that was what triggered me needing to, you know, take all these courses at University of Chicago, you know, hire an executive coach, get 
my game on because I was 34 and I was about to, you know, run this company, be managing director of an international company. And it totally changed my life. And at the same time, it felt different than a different type of change because it was a change that was an opportunity that, you know, came like magic on a phone on the Nile River. That's very different than the change that you have to make internally when you're deciding to shift your life, right? So that type of change to me, even though it's not as sexy, it's not as dramatic as the phone call on the Nile, um, it's more work. It's more effort. You have to trust yourself more. It's easier to say yes to an opportunity that's handed to you on a silver platter than it is for you to say, gosh, I don't even know. There's definitely not going to be a silver platter. There might not even be a paper plate for me. And I am going to make this decision anyhow. That is a different type of change. And it takes a different type of courage and a different type of vulnerability. So um, it's not as sexy. It's not as emotional. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, it is. Yeah. So it's like this was the gift that was given to you that ended up steering you actually away from being in this field forever. Yeah, it's in, in a funny way. It was the challenge. And because I had to be challenged in that way, that I um, it was that friction that I needed to understand, you know what? I actually need to go into this, this, this field because funny enough, and here we go, another change point before I moved to London, I, we had gotten engaged and I was having panic attacks in, in New York. I was very stressed out and I said, you know what? I really want to go back to school and study social work. And it was me quitting my job at that point. Once again, not a sexy moment right? Not sexy. I just called them. I look, you know, I really want to study social work. This is what I'm, so I'm going to resign. And so I had done that and they said, wait, don't quit. We need you in London. Can you move to London temporarily to look at our London office and help get our London office in order? And then you can go back to school after that. So that's, so that, so I tried to quit there this is my Al Pacino thing. And they kept pulling me back in. They said, no, move to London. Then I'm in London. Everything's fine. Everything's golden. And I'm like, wait a minute, come back, move to Chicago. And so I moved back to Chicago. And so I had been in that field for about 20 years. And I got to the point where I was like, look, I want to actually have a different impact. And the way that I realized that actually was by being in the moment myself. I really started to understand how I could then support the people that I was working with in a different way, like in a more holistic way. So there was the, the expertise of filmmaking and post-production and advertising, and that came into play. But then there were also other leadership concepts, emotional intelligence concepts, you know, change management concepts that really ended up feeding, feeding, you know, feeding me as a leader, but then it also allowed me to be more accessible and also lead my team in a different way, right? So, you know, there was, this year was just one of those years. I ended up, I knew I moved back to Chicago. I was having a difficult time in my marriage. That year I ended up, that was the year that I started working with an executive coach. I ended up getting a divorce, quitting that job that I had, you know, I'd worked there for over a decade starting up another job, which I'll call it the rebound job, and then starting my own company and taking on the, the, the company that I had just worked for as a client. That year, there was so much, like, talk about change. It was just like a whirlwind of change. And the only reason why I was able to do that was because I didn't fight with reality. You know, I was in the moment. I had to kind of give up striving right? This idea of, okay, I have to keep trying so hard for all of these other people. And that sounds kind of funny because I'm a big, I'm very into servant leadership, but when you're doing it for the wrong reasons, or if you're doing it, yeah, doing it for the wrong reasons or doing it at the detriment of yourself and your personhood, it just doesn't work. 
right? So that year I had to pick things apart one by one. And so, you know, I worked through the changes that I needed to go through with my husband, soon to be ex-husband at that time. And I gave it the attention that it needed. And then once that felt complete, then I was able to look at my career and I was able to look at the people around me and see how I could best do that in a way that was healthy for me, a win for everybody. And I didn't actually know what any of it would look like, right? So there were these moments of being, you know, super uncomfortable, super vulnerable, and, you know, things that you never think are supposed to happen. Like at one point, I was sitting in my office and one of my clients came in and he was a very important client. I knew that he had been through a divorce and he was working on like, it was a big project that we were working on. He walks into my office and he's asking me a question about something and I just burst into tears. Like I just burst into tears out of nowhere because I was so, it was about, you know, the stress that was going on in my life and everything. And he just looked at me like, and he just gave me this big hug and it, it all was okay. They do say never cry at work. And there is some merit to that. Um, you don't want to cry at work because of work. But if you're just being a human being with other people, whether they're your clients or your team or your boss, like it's actually okay. And so I allowed myself to not know. And that's a big deal especially when you're in a leadership position and you want to be doing a good job, you want to feel like you know all the time or that you have the answer. So to say, okay, I don't have the answer here and I don't know what the next step is going to look like. And at the same time, you have to be able to be willing to look at what might happen, right? So it's not like, oh, I don't know. There's, we, you know the difference between someone's like, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, there's not any willingness in that. I, just, I don't know. I don't know. It's sort of like, I don't know. I don't care. But if you're like, wow, we really don't know what's happening. And so let's just be with what's going on and we'll just look for the clues, you know, and we'll just take one micro step after the next micro step. And eventually the piece, of, the piece puzzles all come together. Right. right. Like there's a not knowing that's about copping out and there's a not knowing that's active. That is perfect. Right. There's like, yeah. And the active one, the active version of not knowing, it's embracing it. Wow. We really don't know. So let's, let's look at, okay, what do we know? There's always going to be at least something that you do know. So if you just take that as the initial seed and you kind of grow from there, it's, that's, 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 that's the only way through. And sometimes the only way through it is through it. So you just have to embrace the vulnerability of it because it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, As you're looking ahead, what's on the horizon? What, what changes do you think are in store for Melissa Thornley? A wonderful question. I would say that um, my natural tendency as, uh, and this impacts things professionally, but let's start with um, the changes as a person. So I am an extrovert. I think out loud. I thrive collaborating with other people. I, I'm an extrovert, right? So if you take a tree analogy, I'm all about the branches and the leaves and how many branches and leaves can get out there. Well, eventually... <laughs> the tree is going to fall over if you don't have like a super strong trunk and roots. So one of the things that I've been focusing on um, in terms of projects, in terms of how I do my work is focusing less on the branches and the leaves and trying to focus more internally on like the work itself, on deepening my own inner knowing, on grounding myself in, um, in with roots right? So now I want the roots to spread out more. And I, I don't know if that's more of an extrovert thing or an, you know, but I, I do think that that plays, that, that plays along with it. So that drives what I do and that drives what I choose to do. So, you know, I'm starting to work on a book and that is a very root focused thing, Mm -hmm. right? 
you can't be, you, you're the only person that can do it, right? So taking the time to do that instead of, you know, oh, I should be networking or I, you know, I need to send those emails. And there are lots of things that one, one can do for their business. And so taking the time to focus on the things that will go deepen the roots is, is huge. Wow. That's a big, that's a big endeavor, particularly if you're a think aloud collaborator, who's used to just sort of like being out there and wanting to create all the branches and leaves as it were. Uh, Writing a book is a very quiet personal endeavor. That's a yes. challenge. Do you, yes. what are you going, what are your, what have you already tried? What do you plan to try to help keep you um, rooted? So Kung Fu, I'm going to tell everybody out there in the world. <laughs> Kung Fu that. is the secret to, it's a, it's my secret. Sauce. I don't know why in the name of all that's holy, my parents didn't sign me up for martial arts when I was a kid because I was kind of a spaz over, you know, but that just wasn't kind of in their purview, right? I was the nerd. I played the piano. I read a lot. I was a school person. I was a theater person. So, but looking back on it, it's, it would have saved me so much trauma and, 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 you know, it would have saved me so much trauma having the discipline of Kung Fu. So now I practice five times a week. It's a lot about balance. It's a lot about grounding. It's a lot about, you know, surveying what's going on with your opponent and understanding different angles and the different things that your body can do. And it's very, it's very grounding. That's the best. It's grounding, but it's also um, owning your power in a different way. And so I'm a green belt now. Hopefully at some point I will be a black belt. I wanted to be a black belt by the time I'm 50, but that's not going to happen. But it, it's, it's on the horizon. Someday I will be a, uh, someday I will earn a black belt. <laughs> I love that. Um, so note to the listeners, Kung Fu. If you want to write a book, oh. Kung Fu. Um, well, as we are coming to the close of our conversation, which has whipped by in the blink of an eye, um, I am wondering if there's any final thoughts, words of wisdom, advice, anything you want to leave people with today? One of the things I would say is to just be aware of who you are and meet yourself where you are and meet others where they are, right? Right. So if we look at that book analogy, knowing how I work, I have to make up games in addition to doing the Kung Fu, which doesn't actually write the book for you. <laughs> what? No, that no. That's unfair. Doing Kung Fu does not write a book, right? Dang it, it does not. Dang it. Um, but it looks at it when you've got these inner opponents that you have in your head, you can figure out how to work around them. And so I might write a blog post that will help me get my writing flow going. Or if I'm working on a, a training session for one of my clients, I start to use that and writing for that will help me write the book as opposed to just sitting down and writing the book. I find different tricks to get myself to write, right? Whether it's a prompt or a deadline or what, what have you. So know yourself meet yourself where you are and be compassionate with yourself and be compassionate with others. I think lots of people talk about self-confidence and we don't talk enough about self-compassion. Mm. Is Self-confidence mm. is, is you have to do the things in order to build the self-confidence because man, I, I feel like throughout my journey, it's your, um, the little voices in your head they get trickier, they get stronger, you know, they like, it's, you, you think, okay, well, wait a minute. No, I learned that. And I learned how to deal with that. And I'm, I'm so cool. I'm so fine. You're not like you, because then you think, wait a minute, I know better, right? They always, there's that, and that phrase is everywhere right now, know better so that we can do better. Well, that's mm -hmm. true. We know better. We're trying to do better. But in the meantime, it doesn't negate the fact that we are going to screw up. So just being able to like, that's where the compassion comes in, like the combination of compassion of being okay with it and 
mindfulness of being able to just let all those thoughts just keep going like a ticker tape at the bottom of, you know, Bloomberg. Just, we'll just let it go. Um, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts and for sharing your journey. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I love the questions that you ask. I love how you ask them. I love the insights <laughs> that you bring to the conversation. It's just, it's just, it's a pleasure conversating with you. Ava. Oh, go on. Thank you. Um, I'll, ch- I'll, I'll coffee talk with you anytime. Yes, likewise. A pleasure conversating with you as well. Um, so if people want to find you, where do they look? Oh, gosh. Well, if you Google Melissa Thornley, I will come up and that will be fine. But you can find me at melissathornley.com. A lot of my women's leadership work, I do that through Tiara International. And um, that's tiaraleadership.com. And so those are the two main places where you can find me. Very cool. All right. And I'll post links to all that stuff anyway. So you don't even really have to Google much. You can just read the show notes where links will read the live. Show read the show notes. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Whether talking about life change, career change, or perspective change, it seems to me that Melissa's suggestion to have a healthy dose of being really present with what's happening and really compassionate with yourself may be the unlock to navigating changes, big, small, self-created, or externally imposed. I love the way Melissa phrased it. Sometimes you may not know what's going on, and as a leader, whether of others or just for yourself in your own life, it's good to be able to pause and say, wow, I don't know what's going on. So let's just take a moment to sit in this discomfort and take a look at the clues. Also, maybe Kung Fu. For links to Melissa Thornley's website and more, check out the show notes for this episode at www.thechangepodcast.com. If you aren't already a subscriber of the show, please consider becoming one. And if you are, please consider leaving us a review along with your five-star rating. Thank you for listening to The Changed Podcast. I'm Aiden Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about. Mm-hmm.